Welcome to the Northeast Kingdom Voice. I'm your host, Scott Wheeler. Today's guest is Gloria Bruce, the Executive Director of the Northeast Kingdom Travel and Tourism Association. She's here to talk about issues relating to the future of Vermont's Northeast Kingdom. Welcome to the show, Gloria. Thank you for having me, Scott. I appreciate it. Is this the first time you've been? Can, can you can you eat? <coughs> you know, Excuse I've me. often asked people like, if you eat a if you work at a pizza place, can you really eat pizza after working with it all day? Do you still like Ben and Jerry's? Yeah, I, I love Ben and Jerry's. And actually, um, when I worked there, and I don't know if they still do this today, but they would give you three free pints of ice cream every day that you worked. Every day. Um, and my parents owned a country store at the time, so I actually stored it up all summer. And at college, I was an RA. And that first really dry, boring meeting you have to do where you go through the rules with all the girls and you say, there's no drinking, there's no this, there's no that. I would just lay it all out, all these pints of Ben and Jerry's, and we would all just dig in and plow through that meeting. But yeah, I still love it. So when you came, when you um, arrived at the Northeast Kingdom Travel and Tourism, you, you actually came at a very challenging period of time just because, you know, the Northeast Kingdom, you know, like the rest of the state and the rest of the country, we were going through a lull, or we soon were going to go through a lull. But would you say today, you know, are you really getting excited for what you're seeing now? Yes and no. Um, there's a lot of opportunity right. that I see. There's a lot of potential. Um, but that, it's not just going to be handed to us on a right. silver platter. The small businesses aren't guaranteed mm -hmm. favorable impact. There's a lot of work that <laughs> businesses need to do in order to leverage this. Um, right. And so it's our goal to certainly help them do that. Right. I personally like the direction we're going right now, but there's there's other concerns though that, you know, just how far do you go before you, you rob a region of what makes it special? Yeah, I think, you know, for all of us, and when I say all of us, I'm really referring to, you know, our partners within the tourism industry. We're genuinely aware of the fact that our product um, is really the functioning landscapes. It's the beautiful waterways. Um, it's the authentic and unique part of our culture mm -hmm. and our heritage. Mm -hmm. So I think as we move forward, there's a great deal of focus on sustaining that and preserving that and utilizing that um, to make our offerings unique and special within the state. So in other words, you, you would hate to see us recreate a Disney world in the Northeast Kingdom. Yeah, I mean, I certainly think that there's room for growth, I, but I think the growth should be strategic. I right. think it should be tactical, and I think it should be done with a keen focus on making sure that we don't sacrifice the things that we love the most right. about our home. Right. The, I know not everybody agrees with me, but when I take a historical look at, let's say, Newport, because Newport and Jay, and to a degree, Burke, they're ground zero for these these uh, things that are going on. But Newport, for example, just in the last, say, decade or so, we lost several hundred workers in the ski um, products trade. You know, the jackets, the coats, you, know, you had, the, right. had uh, Bogner and you had Slalom. So that's probably in the last 20, 25 years. Um, I look at it as almost getting back some of the stuff that we've lost. It's like at the uh, earlier part of the last century, we had four hotels. Uh, and until 1907, we had a hotel that could have about 400 guests in it. Right. And so, but over those decades, we've slowly gone the other direction. And so I just think we're starting to get back some of the stuff we lost, just a little bit more high tech. Yeah, I think for people, irregardless of whether, um, whether it's the return of something we've lost or if it's all just new, it's change. Right. And I think any time that we see you know, change of this nature, it makes people a little nervous. Right. Um, they want assurances that really nobody can give them. It's all just a matter of utilizing the best planning that, um, that we can come up with, um, trying to foresee every opportunity um, and every you know, pitfall that, that right. may be out there um, and adjust our strategies accordingly to ensure that we're, we're doing the best that we can with the opportunities that are 
right. made available. You know, I think though a lot of what's going on. There's a good mix though. There's tourism, mm -hmm. there's industry, uh, and there's you know it just just a whole good mix. Uh, it isn't work because if we relied only on tourism, I don't think there's a lot of future in just tourism. Yeah, I, I would agree that it needs to be a balanced mix of the different economic sectors. And um, one of the things I would say that I see in the Northeast Kingdom that I, I don't necessarily see um, elsewhere in the state is this connectivity between the economic sectors. So agriculture and tourism, for example, the way that they're uniquely blended in the Northeast Kingdom creates a very favorable impact for both. I think the new tasting center on the main street of Newport is a great example. Mm -hmm of this where you have you know wonderful um, agricultural offerings and and products of the northeast kingdom um, developed into a tourism mm -hmm. asset and it's beneficial for both of those economic sectors um, we certainly see the same thing right now um, in a relationship between education um, and tourism um, there is a great collaboration right now amongst educational partners and tourism assets uh, knowing that these new jobs are coming. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a clean examination of what are the positions going to be, what are the skills and qualifications needed, and how do we develop um, programming and educational opportunities to ensure that when these jobs come online, the people who live here mm -hmm. can have the skills to compete for them um, so that we're not just consistently importing talent. So again, we're seeing growth in the educational opportunities, mm -hmm. we're seeing growth in agriculture, we're seeing growth in tourism, Manufacturing, as you said, this is something that you know everyone is collaborating very efficiently to to ensure okay. that we're successful. You, you mentioned the Taste and Center. I haven't been there yet, mm -hmm. even though anything I've read about it and seen about it, it seems like such a great idea. Actually, but there seems to be a bit of a disconnect right now about what the Taste and Center is, and that's how come I've invited the. Uh, I'm hoping that the uh, Taste and Center folks will come on because I think. You know they got to get their message out because I think you know I think it's going to be a great thing. Uh, Main Street in Newport is really starting to look up. But you know uh, those of us who live here, twelve months a year, sometimes we don't see the subtle changes for for both right. good and bad. Right. My uh, my children. Well, now with the exception of one who's moved back to Vermont to attend grad school at UVM, but my sons were down here and they had some of their friends. Uh, for um, down here with them, and these people had traveled a lot, and they they toured Newport, and even my sons, because they only come back every few months now, they can see the little changes that we don't see every right. day, and their friends were just amazed how beautiful the city was. Yeah, they they noticed there were too many empty storefronts and stuff like that, but the overall beauty. And the you know, and I can go up Main Street like uh, I used to go up Main Street and I just wanted to close my eyes because it it looked so bad. Yeah. And now it's slowly starting to head in the right direction. Yeah. And <clears throat> excuse me, honestly, I don't know that it's happening all that slowly. I mean, comparatively, if we look at other communities and other cities, um, it's it's usually decades long. Um, but we've seen some dramatic changes even in the last two or three years. And I well, think the addition of the tasting center um, is, a, is, a, is a clean example of that. I mean, that's a, it's a very transformative right. addition to me. I guess when I, see, this is, this is something I get uh, from other people too. When I, I, I look at things over a historical period, like I don't see that the Northeast, that, that, uh, that Newport has been very vibrant since I graduated in 1984, and and I was probably you know that generation was the one we got to experience the demise of Main Street, right. and and it's it's struggled ever since then. It, it's it's uh, but on the other hand is we make it sound like this was the only time we've struggled. Is North every community, including Newport. You know, it's it's had to adapt to its uh, in new and involving environment. Mm -hmm. uh, when when automobiles came to uh, the region, uh, 
and people didn't travel so much by railroad anymore that we were relied upon. We had to evolve over that. It, it's been one, right. it, 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 and finally we got the, you know, we have the, our feet underneath us now, but I, I still think uh, it, it took a while, but I think we're headed in the right direction. I, I agree, and I think there are communities that are still struggling to adapt, uh, you know, Island Pond with the loss of the railroad and things like that. Mm. Um, it's a matter of really looking around and saying, you know, what are our assets? What mm. do we have that we can share and celebrate and that people would enjoy? And I think, you know, when you look at the city of Newport, it's absolutely spectacular, mm. situated right on the waterfront, and there's a lot going from it. And I think, you know, the reality is, is that uh, connecting it to the local farms the infusion of local foods, not just with a tasting center, but um, you know, I've been to the east side recently and they've redeveloped their menu to include a lot of local offerings and things of that nature. Um, you know, we're, we're all headed in the right direction. And I think what's fantastic about it is that we're doing this by simply connecting neighbors. Sure. We're taking owners of restaurants and connecting them with farmers and so on and so forth. And, and as a result, everybody's beginning to grow and we're seeing the, the benefits of that. You know, too often I think what people do is instead of looking at what we have, they focus on everything we don't have. Mm -hmm. Like what I tell people is the Northeast, and you'll probably agree with this, the Northeast Kingdom is not for everybody. It's not no, for some people to vacation. It's not for some people to live here. Because uh, if you're looking for action-packed, if you're looking for amusement rides, you know, you're not going to... Box you're not gonna stores. Find, and right, and you're not going to find it. But um, I have... Uh, I, uh, for once, I actually think my thinking was actually ahead of the curve. That's how come part of me, I, I started the Northland Journal because I have been connecting the past to the present for the last 12 years because, and I think there's so many opportunities in this area now for people who have these unique ideas. You know, they might not be able to start up full time, but I think there's a, you're having a lot of niche businesses now, aren't you? Yeah, I, and we've seen that traditionally. A lot of the businesses that we partner with in the tourism industry are you know, smaller mom and pop businesses. Um, but we've, we're certainly seeing an, an elevation of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, down in the community of Burke, um, a wonderful couple just moved up and they're starting a confectionery business mm -hmm. um, and making all sorts of different chocolates and things of that nature. And they're, they're doing that conscious of the fact that the market that is there is going to be growing. Um, and so we are seeing um, entrepreneurs who have these great ideas, these really unique ideas, coming to the area with a recognition that the area is going to grow. And they're starting their businesses slowly. Um, and we're hopeful that we'll see transformation along not just the main streets of Newport, but main streets across the Northeast Kingdom um, because there is an, a recognition and acknowledgement of the fact that more and more visitors are going to be coming to the area. Right. And uh, because in my own business, I can tell you I've already, mul well, I wouldn't say multiplied, but business has grown tremendously. The more the Northeast Kingdom's in the news, uh, the more, you know, people want to know about it. And it's, and a lot of people just want to know about today, but a lot of people, like when I travel somewhere or where my kids live, I might not have a direct connection to that community other than my kids, but I want to know the history. What truly makes it tick? Right. So with me, that's been a, you know, it's been a great thing. And I think your role is so important because what we don't want to see happen in all of this growth and development is we don't want people to come into this area either with an entrepreneurial interest or as you know a new resident and be disconnected from who we are and what our values are and what traditionally um, you know, this region has been and what it's known for. And so I think you know, that is probably one of the most important roles is as we move forward and as more and more people turn their eyes to the kingdom and start saying, well, what is this place all about? I think the journal um, and, and you know, this, this program and your radio show and things like that, it helps people to understand more fully who we are historically, traditionally, right. what our values are, but also um, some of the more interesting things that are going on today. Right. So, in in the his in understanding the history isn't only about then, but it's like um, when when people move here, if they understand the history, they try to, 
they might understand why we do some of the crazy things we do. Right. Uh, it's like, for example, we do have a fierce independent streak in us. Uh, like it, it became uh, like when I served in the state house. The one thing I learned real quick when I was running is growing up in rural America, you might as well air your own dirty laundry because <laughs> somebody is going to air it for you. Yeah. And so uh, I remember when I announced uh, my uh, announced I was running for the house. It just dawned on me, and it came out, is I said, well, this is funny. I'm announcing I'm running for the Vermont State House only 100 yards from where federal revenue has took my uh, grandfather into custody for prohibition violations. And uh, so I actually record, you know, I think sometimes people, there, there's a fringe, there's a little group that maybe wished I would go away <laughs> uh, because I am more than happy to record uh, you know, history isn't always pretty. No, no. I've recorded the the rum runners. I have recorded the really seedy part of our history too, which was the cross burnings that took place during the nineteen twenties and thirties. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole identity here, and like you say, I think it's it's inaccurate to just pick and choose the pretty parts and, right. and showcase those and say, well, the rest of this we're just going to kind of tuck yeah. away. Um, and I think it's really important. I mean, we're working really hard right now, even just to connect our new hospitality workforce. People are coming in from outside the area um, and they're not familiar with the region as a whole and so we're working pretty aggressively to connect them with a lot of this history and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the offerings that are here because you know, our products are somewhat unique. It's not necessarily just a large scale attraction, it's also a small mom and pop farm and what have you. And so, you know, it, it is interesting when you're in a position where you have to connect people with a bigger picture, with a full story, and not all of that story is going to be perfect. Um, right. You know, and, and I think the Northeast Kingdom landscape um, is a great example of that. You can go by these beautiful areas, some of the most spectacular lakes in the state or, or questionably in the country, and then you're two minutes down the road and everything's kind of a little derelict and run down, and, and then you move on another mile and everything's beautiful again. Um, so it's, it's the reality of who we are, and I think, you know, um, we should celebrate that. I, 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 don't, I think people who come here are going to, that's what they're going to experience. Right. Right. So why not just tell the story? When I, uh, when I travel, which is quite a bit, uh, I always, I'm always drawn to, for some reason, I don't know why, but now to the books, to the, the book section, the local book area, you know, right. where, and, and I notice in some areas, uh, they do so much of a better job at celebrating their history and culture, it, or just who they are, much better than we we do. And and I'm you know from my angle, I'm probably part of the blame too. That uh, that I guess I need to step up the pace. I write a little bit more. I write a little bit more. Yeah, you know I think we're lucky. You may be right that there's not um, maybe not a lot in terms of quantity, but right. I think there's a quality. I think yeah. we've got. You know some wonderful storytellers who've captured some really important, you know, pieces of the kingdom. Um, whether it's yourself or Bethany or what have you, you know, I think there's a few pieces that we can really turn to. But I, I think it would be great for us to have more to share. Right. So what do you think? Like for example, as we record the show, I have a meeting with uh, Yankee Magazine for lunch today. Later this week, I have the Burlington Free Press, and these are not about me this is about uh, the area uh but hardly a week goes by that i'm not contacted by the media i don't mean just the local media with all respects to them but i mean the media throughout especially right. the northeastern united states what do you think that is doing for the northeast kingdom well i mean obviously there's a lot of advantage um to being you know in the limelight and to having our story told um and so i think it's it's a great opportunity i think it's uh, really a matter of connecting them with the right people um so that we can share the story of the kingdom in an honest um, and really truthful way um but it's wonderful i mean to have yankee up here photographing Newport and meeting with the local population and to get that out um, into you know, their community um, is a phenomenal opportunity for Newport and I think it really reflects on um, a lot of the different efforts that have been taking place here whether it's you know the development efforts through EB5 or um, the efforts of Newport City Renaissance Corporation 
you know, I think collectively there's a lot going on. People are, are learning about all of the different moving parts. Um, and they're fascinated not just by any one piece of it, but by the network um, and the, the inner connectivity of all of us. I think, you know, they make one phone call and suddenly they're connected to five different stories that are unique and different. And they're seeing um, just a, a collaboration of neighbors who genuinely care about their home and are making things happen. And I think at the end of the day, that's probably the biggest story of all is the way that everyone is coming together to right. coordinate and connect. Because yeah, usually, usually what the media will do with me, because I, I don't believe, I never believe the story should be about me. And nothing I, you know, I don't think the media should focus just on certain people. So when they contact me, I said, well, you don't really want to talk to me, but you know, I'll find out what angle they have, you know, what their, what their angle is, but I will, direct them to some really unique people because when I visit an area I don't I want to know the people I don't right you know you tourism folks are great but I I, I want to know the loggers the fishermen exactly is like uh, I was on a, a show uh, out of Boston for half an hour the Chronicle but I uh, but I, the guy that I had on there he really upstaged everybody David Lawrence from mm -hmm. uh, from Albany, he Pete the Moose fame. He lives in a house in Albany without any electricity. And some people might say he's a kook. David Lawrence is far from a kook. The guy is ingrained. He's the last of the true Northeast Kingdom mountain men. Mm -hmm. He didn't rail against the change. He didn't celebrate it. He just laid it out. And uh, I try to connect, because that's my whole work, is trying to give the people who typically don't have a voice, I give them a voice. And that's what I do with the media. I say, okay, you, you're looking for this, or I'll direct them to like Danny. Yeah. Sometimes Danny Gore, he, uh, you know, Norm Lewis, Danny Gore, the comedian, and or just uh, like Friday, um, this uh, later in the week, uh, the Burlington Free Press is coming up to interview some of the people I've interviewed who uh, had were connected to the poor farm, mm -hmm. uh, the poor farms of the Northeast Kingdom. So uh, th their requests are so diverse. Well, and, and those are the stories we want to tell. Yeah. Um, and that's what people come here to be connected with. Right. I, I think, you know, if people are looking for um, a theme park type of vacation yeah. experience, there's a variety of different places that they can go. Um, and I think that the, the type of traveler that's attracted to the kingdom, you know, it's either the sportsman community, it's a hunting community, um, sport fishermen. If you thought you were better than him, because he wasn't any dummy, if, he, if you were talking down to him, he wouldn't give you the time of day. Yeah. Uh, his family were known for their deer hanging tree right out near the road. Some people didn't like it, most people loved it. Uh, one day, uh, I call him Boston Billy, about 20 years ago, Boston Billy showed up at his door. Uh, saw those deer hanging here. He was up here, never, he, he wanted to hunt, but he'd never hunted before. He had a gun with him and he, he couldn't, couldn't do anything. And um, so uh, my father-in-law came out and he, he sensed a real desire that this kid wanted to learn and Billy's nose started here ended up he'd been in too many bar fights and uh, he was a real right. rough rough guy and uh, so my father-in-law sensed a real desire well fast forward uh, Billy is now a wealthy paving contractor uh, he was the pallbearer in my mother-in-law's uh, mother-in-law's funeral he was in my father-in-law's obituary uh, he spent thousands of dollars on my father-in-law every year and every he gets several deer every year in multiple states It was just because Billy Took the time to listen listen to this poor old Vermonter and Treat him like he was somebody because he was somebody yeah, and that they were the best of friends and he that was we used to say that was his uh, That was his fifth uh, that was his fifth kid. Yeah, I think what I've found is that there can be tremendous relationships that develop between people who come to this area and connect with the locals mm -hmm. at that level. Sure. And, it, you know, it can be life altering in both ways because we can, you know, really come to understand where they're from and, you know, who they are and what their background is and vice versa. 
but I do think that it's the unique traveler that has that experience right. um, because it takes a connection between two people who you know are really open to right. sharing their life story yeah. in that way. You know, every once in a while, one thing that I hear and I, I don't know if it's much of an issue, but you know, when you're a local, we've always been accepting of newcomers. It's like during uh, my radio show for is uh, I think it's going to be a two-part radio show is going to be on the Frog Run Farm, which mm -hmm. was a commune in in Charleston. Uh, right. Is during the late sixties and early seventies. We embraced the commune movement that moved here. We had a number of communes. Mm -hmm. You know, the locals looked at them with, you know, these long-haired people, looked at them like with a little bit of hesitation. But once they realized they had a lot in common, those two groups really meshed. And right. I, I, think, I think if people are willing to listen to us, I think, you know, we can mesh with anybody. Uh, well, and I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head when you said once they realized there was something in common. Right. And I think that's the most important thing for us to really focus on when we, you know, when I go out and I'm trying to market the Northeast Kingdom, I'm not talking to just anybody. And I'm not interested in bringing just anybody to right. the kingdom. We have to find those people who share some commonality with us and who will appreciate us for who we are and what we have here. Um, and, and that's really important. And I think where some of the, you know, the trepidation about all of this change is coming from is that, you know, we're talking to so many people in so many places about so many things. Are we going to bring people here or are people going to be interested in coming here that maybe we don't have that much in common with? Um, and perhaps who are not interested in the same things that we are. And I think that's where, you know, people start to get a little bit nervous about, you know, where is this all going to go and where is it all going to lead? Um, and it's important for us to really, as people come into the area, um, ensure that we share our stories and that we find those commonalities with them so that they um, come either, you know, either currently they do appreciate those things, but if they don't, they come to appreciate um, some of the things that we value about well, like, the kingdom. Yeah, because everyone, that's where I think history and culture, understanding it really matters. Because I've heard people say, they'll see a logging operation. They'll say, look, we're stripping the state right. of its trees. And right. you'll say, well, wait a minute here. Here, look at these pictures back from the 19, even, well, right. even, when I, even in the 60s and the 70s, when I was growing up, there were less trees. But you go back to like the 20s and the 30s is, you know, there were parts of the state that were still almost barren yeah. of trees. Is we are, you know, we as in like the loggers, like my brother-in-laws and the farmers, they are great stewards of the land. Absolutely. And I think, you know, people don't understand the benefits to the wildlife and all of these other things. And... Yeah, that's a perfect example where people will go by, a, you know, a, an area that's been logged and, the, you know, and they're, oh, how sad. And it's just, it's awful. I can't believe that they did that. And yet when I go by, I'm like, oh, you know, the moose are going to love that next year yeah. as the saplings come up and what have you. And so I think it's, you know, it is a matter of just ensuring that as people come, um, that we make the effort to connect with them um, mm -hmm. and ensure that, you know, there's an understanding of, what the Northeast Kingdom is all about, and, and that's good, bad, and otherwise. Do you ever, I, I don't know if this is your role, and I, I know probably it's my role to a degree, is do you ever get out there and really talk to, like, the loggers? Because I know you talk to the, you're involved with the farmers, but there's, you know, the loggers and that, they have their own unique yeah. role in the area? Not as much today um, in, my co in my current role. Um, you know, my current role is very tourism specific. Right. Um, and certainly I think, you know, from an editorial standpoint or what have you, there's a lot of value in showcasing the loggers or what have you. But I would highlight that I grew up <clears throat> with a family that owned a country store. Mm -hmm for 17 years um, and it was a small you know community country store in Waterbury Center um, and it was the, you know the epicenter of that community and it was the the road crew and the loggers and the farmers and the politicians it was just a melting pot of community culture and I think that my time growing up there I literally you know grew up in that store 
um, has given me um, all of the insight that I need to really understand what matters um, and what matters to me, I guess I should say, in, in my home. Um, and I do try in all of my efforts with the Tourism Association to keep my eye on that um, and really make sure that we're focusing on sustainable tourism and tourism that helps to celebrate you know, all of the different um, types of people who live here. Right. Um, and so, you know, for me, I want to ensure that whether you're, you know, a logger or you're part of a road crew or you run a farm where you do this or that, that, you know, that tourism doesn't run over you, right. so to speak, because it can. And right. I think that's, you know, it's a reality. We've seen it in the state of Vermont. As I said, I grew up in Waterbury Center. It's just south of Stowe. Mm. Um, and my hometown became... Um, you know, I was priced out of my hometown. Right. I couldn't afford to purchase a house there. A tiny little house on a little lot cost so much money. Oh, sure. The taxes were so high, um, and so I think those are all you know things that everybody has a keen focus on. This is all about balance um, and making sure that we can preserve all of the different lifestyles and that the kingdom is still affordable and within reach um, for us. Yeah, you know what I noticed when I was in the state house, and I, I know this isn't only limited to legislators, but I, it used to, I used to roll my eyes as some of the legislators, especially from the, 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 the wealthier ones, they would look at people like my brother-in-laws who are loggers, and they would look at them with pity, like, what can we do for these people? And you can't do anything because they love their work. Absolutely. And they, yeah. and they go home to these, you know, if you saw them out, because like one way, this is about, you know, these business owners are going to understand is one of my brother-in-laws, he has this beautiful, beautiful hilltop home. But if you saw him out, you wouldn't know he had anything. So he often judged who he was going to do business with, who treated him with respect when he went in in his login clothes. I mean, clean, but right. his login clothes. Right. And he always knew who he wanted to do business wasn't he, with, and he still does, basically how they treat him when he's coming out of work. Yeah, I mean, I think you touched on it earlier, you know, what is wealth? And um, and there's, there's different types of people who view it very differently. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I think some people look at, you know, these, this is my checkbook balance and that makes me wealthy. And they're some of the most impoverished people I know um, in terms of how, um, what they have in their lives. And then I know people who can't rub two pennies together and they're the richest people I know. They're I out. fall somewhere in between. Yeah, <laughs> that, I think that's you know, the comfort level for most people. But you know, I think you know, I know a lot of Vermonters who you know, struggle their week to week with, with dollars and cents. But you know, the reality is, is that you know, they're living their lives um, either, you know, on the farm or in the woods or, you know, working, making a living off this landscape. Um, you know, and I think, you know, even when I look at some of my friends who are, who are homesteaders, um, they don't have electricity, they don't have this, they don't have that, but they're home, they're with their children, they're raising their families, um, and I, I look at them and I'm, tremendously envious of what they have and it's certainly not a new Volvo or this or that. So. Now, we've talked about a lot of the, the good things that are going on here, um, you know, like with Newport and Jay, but there, you know, there, like, there's still like, let's say Derby Line, it's still, str you know, because, you know, it's struggles actually began decades ago, partly in response to the interstate. Right. Uh, and then, then in, in I think the late 60s, Mammoth Mart went in and started uh, to, you know, where the Shaw's Plaza is now. And, you know, it's still trying to struggle to find its place, even though I, I'm sensing that even there, it's starting, because you now have the, uh, the old Butterfield Mansion. Right. Uh, which is, then a lot of people would remember is Dr. Vebers living there. Uh, that's undergoing a massive renovation into a you know an inn and a restaurant. But are you are you, do you work on these? Do you help businesses in these trouble spots as well? Well, we're we're starting to do a little bit more of that. Um, we've actually um, obtained some funding uh, to try to assist businesses. Um, it's a project we're calling the Competitive Communications right. Grant where we can work one-on-one -on -one with these different businesses. Um, you know, it's really interesting in the hospitality community, and I, I've said this a, a lot of times, people have heard me say it, um, 
I, I always joke, you know, I'm a smart girl. It doesn't mean I should go and change the brakes on my car. Right. I know I was never given those skills. No one ever taught me how to do that. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I'm going to hit a tree right. kind of thing. And yet we have a number of people who have this um, new heart dream of, I'm going to move to Vermont and open an inn. Mm. Um, they've never taken a class. They, they have no history, you know, no background, no education, no, no experience in being an innkeeper. Mm -hmm. um, and they come to Vermont and they buy their inn and, and then it's like, oh gosh, you yeah. know, what, what is this? It's, yeah. it's seven days a week. It's, you know, from morning until night yeah. and so on and so forth. And, um, and it's all very new. And so we are starting to partner um, with that funding one-on-one -on -one with different businesses in the tourism industry that um, either were pre-existing or that are new um, to try to help them to fully understand how they can take advantage of all of these changes. I think, you know, what I've heard and the communications I've had, you know, with um, Bill and other folks um, at Burke and, and, and Jay and what have you is, the goal here is that the rising tide floats all boats. I think we've all heard Bill say that many, many times. Right. And so, you know, where I feel, I know um, Bill and all the others associated with their projects, they're going to do a, a fantastic job. Right. They're going to dot right. all the I's, they're going to cross all the T's. And I feel personally like where I can contribute is to say, okay, well, how can I help the other boats adjust to the new tide? Right, right. Um, and so um, it's something that we're, we're sharply focused on and that I'm trying to put a lot of personal and professional energy into um, so that as business owners look at you know, what is really one of the, the biggest changes in the economic landscape in recent history, um, that they feel supported. Um, and I'm certainly seeing the same type of response from um, the NVDA, the Northeastern Vermont Development Association, um, Northern Community Investment Corporation, NCIC, and all of these other assets are kind of standing up and saying we're here mm -hmm. and we're happy to help. Um, we're seeing the Small Business Development Center do the same. So um, there is a, an entire network of support mm -hmm. um, that is available for businesses across this region mm -hmm. to help them adapt as we grow and change. You know, I think one thing, and I am totally guilt guilty of this, there's a lot of us who actually think too small is because you, yeah. you hear about the people who think really big but like for example is there are uh you have to understand like our audience here is so huge like we love to we love to think that we live out in the middle of nowhere right uh my my uh one of my sons lives in northern maine that's right. in the that's middle, the of, middle of, nowhere. of nowhere right <laughs> we have so many people at our doorsteps and these visitors, they come from all walks of life. And, and I just think, uh, like, like for example, when I started up the journal, I, I, I had the grand scheme of where I was going, but I, I've evolved over time, but it's because it's, it's just over a period of time, but uh, there's a wider audience out there for people. It's like uh, I grew up with Tina Carter Bliss, who owns the hoagies chain in right. Vermont pie and pasta and those are people who know how to do it and they know how to do it right and so I use what I do is I I actually I don't join groups I don't uh, I think I, yeah, I belong to the Northeast Kingdom Chamber I don't join groups because I can't be an active participant right it's I'm too busy right but I have my own little you know I think a lot of us business people actually have our own unofficial chambers, you know, people that you can... A network, yeah, yeah your network, network with, of, uh, of folks. Because uh, you know, that's, what I, that's what I do uh, because, you know, there are a lot of people doing things right. Yeah. And most of them are more than happy to share their secrets, you know, as long as you're not in direct competition. Yeah, I mean, what we're seeing right now and, and two of the things that I'm, you know, that I see a lot of... Um, you know, as, as you had mentioned, some people just are thinking small and they could really think very big. You know, what we're seeing is that many of our business owners are so entrenched in running their business mm -hmm. that it's really challenging to stop and plan for the growth oh. or the future of their business. They're, you know, it's, they're entrenched. It's seven days a week, as I said. It's 10, 12 hours a day. Um, so we're, we're running up against that. But what we're also finding is that there are people who are remarkably comfortable being small. Well, that's it. And right. they don't want to grow. And they're like, this is this is what I can manage. This is comfortable for me. I'm not going to be a millionaire, but I'm not, you know, I'm not in trouble either. 
Um, and so that's a really interesting posture to be in because as we increase the bed base, if you look at Jay or if you look at Burke or even here in Newport, we're increasing the amount of beds available for travelers mm -hmm. exponentially. Right. Um, and what it does mean is, you know, you can be a small inn or B&B, but you, want, you need to examine how you're going to set yourself apart and how you're going to be different and who your market's going to be and um, how you're going to be competitive. And in some cases, particularly in Burke, that's all very new. Right. Um, and they're going, do I want to, you know, do I want to run a business like that? Do I want to be competitive? Do I need, do I want to be shrewd? Do I want to grow? Um, and those are all really great questions. Um, and for those businesses that, you know, come to the conclusion of like, I don't want to throw my hat in that game, um, you know, we want to help them to transition. And right. for those that are looking to say, yeah, you know, this is going to be great. I can leverage this. I can make the changes. We want to help them find the right path for them. Oh, so. I couldn't agree with you more because if we, if we all become the same, you know, you, you can't differentiate. Uh, it's like, for example, is in the history world, most of us get along great. Uh, the Orleans County Historical Society, which every county should have something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Is their history is most of it is the bygone history. I like to sit down with my history and interview my history. So we have this great working relationship with the, you know, because we're in different areas, we help out each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think that's the way it should be. But, but you were talking about the, the very act of, you know, some people are so busy in their business yeah. as much as it, it's like, it's been in the paper. I've been on VPR. I was one of the people who was laid off from North Country Hospital during their layoffs. And most people think I'm totally whacked and they might not be totally off base. I can't, nobody likes to be laid off. But on the other hand is when I was laid off after 11 great years at the hospital, I said, well, this is great. Let's go full steam ahead. And I had the journal to fall back on, which for 11 years or 12 years, I operated my business like you were saying about these people who were just happy. Right. Uh, but you now, just kind of found that comfort zone. And right. And, and but for the last three years, I had this nagging feel in the journal because the journal is going big places. It's doing super. And I, I started feeling like the hospital work as much as it they were super to work for. I knew it was becoming to be a drag, but because I was treated so well, I knew somebody was going to have to kick me out that door before I would leave. Right. I was kicked out that door five weeks ago, and life is good. And now you can invest in the journal and, yeah. and watch it grow. I mean, you know, I, I you know, personally, I feel like you know, tomorrow's history is yeah. today, oh. right? And I think that's a, a great role for the journal is to capture kind of where we are today, um, because ten years from now, twenty years from now, forty, fifty right. years from now. This is history, right. um, and what we do with this time, I mean, it's important for someone to be the storyteller, and I right. think the journal is a great I, example I, of that. Thanks. I, what I do is I try to, uh, you know, I, I even interview people like Ruth Austin. My, uh, Ruth Austin's 99, 99 mm -hmm. going on 60 in her mind. Right. <laughs> and she can tell you about the days when you now the, the cars were the dominant but there were still people with horses right. tied up on main street right and so she has a long period of time to remember the 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 ebbs and tides mm -hmm. of main street she predates like everybody my generation and the generation before me we like to fawn for the days of the department stores on main street right she remembers the days before the department right. stores. <laughs> right and so so it's it's really good i think to just tie these different generations together and try to find out it's the most important stuff um you know we my my father recently passed and one of the things that you miss the most are are those you know those legacy stories those family stories and you you know losing the history um, that someone a person has within their own mind and their own memory is really a challenge and so i think when you can sit down with people who have um, these memories and these recollections and they and you can capture that story and make it timeless and make it available to be shared not just you know one person to another but with an audience 
I mean, it's phenomenal. I, I mean, am the luckiest. Like I, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm often, uh, when I, when I uh, walked out of the state house, when I stepped out, I, uh, uh, I, I quoted when it, that I, I felt like, you know, Lou Gehrig, the luckiest man alive. And I, and I, I talked about, you know, this was all well and fine. You know, serving in the state house, most people consider that their highest honor. Right. Uh, you know, talking and recording the stories of the people. No, no, that's my high honor. And uh, that's how come when I got out of the state house, they kept re wanting to refer to me as former representative. And they and I would call up the papers humorously say, hey, well, why do you still stay? Well, we, we go to the highest title. I says, well, representative. I said it was an honor, but it's not my highest uh, achievement. Ach right. You know, because I just... Well, I don't look at it as my achievement. I look at it as the people because do you know most of the people who truly have stories to tell, they're not the ones jumping up and down and saying they have a story to tell. Yeah. Most of the time, it's the people who don't even know they have a story. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and that's interesting because right now we're definitely in that situation where there's just there's a lot of noise, and it's important to kind of push through the noise and find you know find the right things that we should share. So yeah, I, I agree. Now, we only have a few more minutes, uh, but every once in a while, as you know, I have a very active Facebook site. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I bring up a lot of these topics uh, or no topics at all, just post photos. But every once in a while, do you ever see, read things on my Facebook site that other people post and you just, like, like <laughs> there was just one. Yeah. That, the mob is invested, yeah. vested in the new. Do you ever wonder where this comes yeah, from? Yeah, I mean, I remember when was it, Scott? Three years ago now, when you and I had a conversation. You're like, I'm thinking about doing Facebook. Yeah, what is, what <laughs> and is I, what is this, Gloria? And I said, Well, let let me talk you through it. <laughs> and I have watched. You know, I remember when you launched the page and yeah. you called and you're like, It's up. You know, and and we chatted about. Okay, well, this is what you can do with it. And I watched your page grow. And I'm and I've just been awestruck by it you know it's grown so fast and the audience is so diverse and sometimes you'll share information about news feeds where, where you don't know who that person is because they're going by some made-up name for the most part the people on Facebook are who they are right so if, if you're uh, if you're operating if nobody knows who you are there are people who will just say things they don't even believe right but if your name is out there for the most part people understand your reputation's out there too so if you get really if yeah. you just get rude and crude and obnoxious besides me hitting the delete button which i very seldom do um i think i think you know people are much more open to sharing in a responsible way yeah and i think you know it's important for us i mean as facebook administrators you have your page and we have um northeast vermont's northeast kingdom page it allows us to to share the photography and the stories and things like that so that people can respond in that way i think is advantageous to us because it gives us that platform and it allows us to continue we posted something the other day and someone was like now i miss my home and they're down in florida you know and it's like those are the kinds of connections we want to make. We want to get people talking about issues that matter. We want them to really see and engage in what Vermont's Northeast Kingdom is. And we want to remind them of what's unique and special in our history and, and where we're at today. So, I mean, I think it's just been fantastic to see your page grow. Well, I know I, I know you connected to one of my stories, at least somebody at your place did, because I try to even take world events and bring them local, like at the birth of of the uh, prince's baby, right? Uh, and you know the the world was fawning over the birth, mm -hmm. which I don't understand myself. It's but uh, you know um, I did connect it to when the king and queen in the 1930s visited the border community, and I interviewed a couple people who remembered their visit, right? And I posted that out there, and I know. It was was it you or somebody else that posted it on that connected to your? Yeah, we shared that. I thought it was really interesting, you know. And I think even people who live here may not have ever been aware of that and didn't know that that had transpired. And those are the types of things where it's like, I think sometimes when you live in the Northeast Kingdom, as you had mentioned previously in our conversation, 
Sometimes people are focused on the things that you don't have, or right. maybe the things that are hard, maybe the things that have been challenging, or things that we haven't been successful at, at accomplishing in the right. past. And Keep yourself to actually make change then. Right. I mean, you know, it's funny, I, I, you know, I, I, going back to the little country store, it was the same people, <clears throat> I'd be cashing out, and it'd be a really cold winter day, and they're like, oh, it's just too cold out yeah. there. And then you'd see them in the summer, and they're like, it's so hot. Oh, yeah. And it, it, you know, it's, it's who they are, it's part of their identity, and I think you're right. I mean, you're just never gonna change that. Um, and it's, I think it's part of, the, part of our neighborhood community that we're just gonna run up against that. No matter what we do, there are gonna be folks that look around, um, and, and they can find something to be dissatisfied with. So we only have a couple more minutes. What more would you like to say about yourself or about your organization? Well, I mean, our organization right now is probably the busiest it's ever been. Um, we're engaged in a variety of different projects. Um, I had touched on the communications project, but we're also building um, a hospitality tourism ambassador program, mm -hmm. um, which is an online, fully online learning platform for people in the hospitality workforce here in the Northeast Kingdom, um, where they can log in at any time, day or night, and learn about the assets that are part of the tourism experience here, um, waterways and you know all of the different attractions and things of that nature. And so this is so our volunteers and people who are perhaps just joining the workforce can really learn about who we are. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll be piloting that this fall, um, and that's a partnership with um, our organization and CCV and St. John's Berry Academy and the North Country mm -hmm. Career Center. Um, and then we're also um, about to unveil a new larger regional uh, brand and marketing campaign. Um, it's applicable to all the different economic mm -hmm. sectors. It's the first time that we've had a cross-cutting marketing um, effort that isn't isolated to just tourism, but can be deployed by agricultural providers and things of that nature, um, real estate agents, you name it. Um, those marketing assets will be available to them. And then we're also finalizing um, a cultural host project. The cultural host project um, is so that we can have a little bit more awareness um, and capability at market, marketing to and hosting Canadian visitors, which mm -hmm. is a really important market for us. Um, it includes an online learning platform as well with 50, um, 50 online language course or classes or lessons mm -hmm. in Canadian French, mm -hmm. um, as well as um, 20 different um, cultural uh, awareness videos, if you will, that help people to understand the differences between Canadian and American culture. So, um, and we've just recently installed the Northeast Kingdom Byway. Um, so we've, we've really been um, at full speed now for the last year, um, and we're continuing to bite off more than we can chew in typical Vermont style. Right. Um, and we're just juggling and managing that all, hoping that we can uh, fill a need and fill a role here and, and be supportive of the tourism community. No, I think, I think uh, you, you were saying that you're busier than ever, um, and I, I really think that these, that we are on the cusp of true change. Now, Absolutely. now we have to make sure it is all good change. Yeah, it won't all be good change. There's no such thing as all good change. That's true too. You know, there'll there will be um, some some sour with the sweet, um, and I think that's reality. Right. I think we all see the you know, see that that could happen. Um, but the good news is, is we've got our, uh, you know, as a network, we've got our eyes wide open and we're looking for ways that we can tip the scales in our favor and ensure that the outcomes are as favorable as they can be. Whether, you know, whether we like it or not, we are in the media spotlight too. Mm -hmm. And that's that's not a common place for us. It and is, but it's usually negative. Right. It's usually, you know, the poor derelict right. you and, know, and so North this, Kingdom of Vermont. This really is an opportunity. Absolutely. So. Yeah, and when I first started at NECTA and I would go to state level meetings, they're like, oh, you're working up in the kingdom. Mm. And it was kind of almost a sorrowful, poor you kind of thing. And now I walk into those meetings, they're like, how are things in the kingdom? You know, so it's, it's changed. The but perception have, is changing. Right, the perception has changed, but we haven't really changed. It's like we are, I, you know, I think we're the most genuine, genuine people there are. And uh, so I think it's like, for example, every once in a while I'll listen to the news or I'll listen to people talk and some of these new ideas. Yeah. Uh, it's like, wait a minute. That's not new. We've been doing that for generations. Yeah, it's the way it's being harnessed. I, I, yeah. I, I actually consider that people are slowly catching up to us. Right. All right. 
uh, you're a regular guest on my radio show, but you certainly have to come back on here. I would you're, love to. You're always a ball. Uh, we, we actually, uh, I think we have a whole lot in common. You come from different angles. I go from there. And uh, yeah. you're, uh, you are so filled with information. Well, it's, I, I really appreciated being here and, um, you know, having time with your new audience yeah. as opposed to the radio show. So anytime, I'm always happy to come and chat with you, okay. Scott. I always appreciate it. All right, thank you for coming yeah, on. Thank you for having me. And thank you to the viewers for tuning in to another segment of the Northeast Kingdom Voice.